Beautiful day to be alive here. The church of what's happening now. Thank you very much for joining us. If you came out to Flappers last night for the fucking benefit, it was a blast. It really fucking it was blast. awesome. That was a great. That's the one thing I don't like about LA because I, I love comedy. It's a lot of you guys who are great don't do shows here. And if you do, it's 15 minutes and it's unannounced. Like there's very few hours here. But the show last night was like six or seven 20 minute sets at a great comic. So that's what you got to do when you live here is go to those shows. We had a fucking great time last night. I'm happy they put it together. I'm happy it all worked out for Christine and whatever. They got a fucking bum dog. They brought it home. It was fucked up. I was thinking about it yesterday. Who brings home a bum fucking dog? You know? Yeah. Well, it happens sometimes. But at least they made the effort. It was a nice turnout. If you came out, God bless you. You know, I don't know how much the tickets were. Fucking food. I was just telling Leah Flappers, listen, these motherfuckers ain't fucking around. They don't give a fuck about Weight Watchers, Paleo, Baleo. They don't give a fuck in there. <laughs> yeah, you were saying they were like grilled cheese and bacon. I didn't eat. I, I just watched the show, so I didn't eat I just had a little but... piece. I had a little, they make little sliders of uh, bacon, cheeseburgers, uh, chicken. They had like a little tray out. Okay. And they had uh, wings. I'm getting sick and fucking tired of people out here making wings. That's why I went on that rant that day. I'm sick and tired. <laughs> At least Flappers does use real blue cheese. They finally got hit. When they opened up, they had this blue cheese garlic mix that was a stoner's fucking paradise. You understand <laughs> me? A stoner's fucking paradise. But it all worked out. You want to know? You want to know? Sure, this? but I got one. Oh, I have a question for you before I go. What? I know they're not buffalo wings. But uh, they had things in Boston called like chicken drummies, and they're, like, they're kind of breaded. And it's not like the regular wings, but it's like kind of spicy, kind of breaded fried wings. Do you like those too, or no? Yeah, man, whatever. You know, if we're going to make buffalo wings, let's get down. You know what I'm saying? Look at Lee with his Emerson shirt today. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Stop burning shit, Lee. Fucking security deposit going to get me up the ass over here, these cocksuckers. What are you blowing smoke about you? What are you blowing smoke about you? What are you blowing smoke about you? What are you blowing smoke on my face for, guys? Uh, but anyway, if you came to Flappers last night, it was a great time. And you probably saw one of the highest Joey Diaz's you've ever seen before. Oh, shit. <laughs> Fucking Lee would need an edible on the way over there. In fact, I got the body of Christ today. The Chiba fucking chew. Fuck you. I don't care what uh, anyone says on Twitter. The edibles he has are not edibles you eat ever. What do he, you do with these? What do you give them to dead bodies? You're no, supposed to eat People these. usually split them up once a year for like the biggest th high they've ever this is, had. This is a and double you, dose. Yeah. This is nothing. No, this that, is that, fuck you double scouts. dose. You got so high you were rubbing my head as you left the show last night. I had to rub your little Jew head. <laughs> Good luck. I'm going to go to the track today. I want to make sure I got everything I got. You know what I'm saying? I haven't laughed you so hard ever. You you know, it's funny that uh, I was telling you guys that I'm pretty much alone out here. No, I'm not. I got Lee. Lee <laughs> cracked me the fuck up. It's like uh, having loops out here. My my dear, dear friend loops. It's the same way. It's it's always a story. It's always a... <laughs> yesterday I called him and... <laughs> Lee, sorry, I woke you up. I, I'm not sleeping. No, no, no. That was somebody else fucking snoring, Lee Cocksucker. Fuck you. He fucking sleeps all day. I get home at five in the morning from work. Fuck, and then he wouldn't eat the other <sighs> one. You should have heard him. No, you're going to eat one today, Cocksucker. Fuck you. You have nothing to do. You I got to get on a flight in That's hour. even better. You ever get on a plane fucking high on an edible? Not that high. Well, the the, the, the last time time. we ate this, we had a meeting. I got there 45 minutes early because I drove 20 minutes, 20 miles an hour the entire way there. Fuck that edible. But you're going to do half of that today. Yeah. We're yeah, going to do a third. You. How's that? A third. Just a yeah, little that's, what, that's, that's Last what you say night I gave him a little fucking Milky Way piece, like a little tiny bit. Oh, he was, guys, he was, <laughs> I even threatened to throw him out of the car, kick Fine. him out of the car in fucking Glendale. Kick me out of the behind car. Behind this Armenian oh. body shop. I the walk his... home. You should have seen how high he was. He couldn't, he, he, like, his eyes were, like, not even open. As he was driving home, don't fucking believe he fucking this guy. got on stage, and it, it was fucking hilarious. But the highest I've ever seen him, and he was rubbing my head. Listen, I said, "Well, I can go." These are the church. These, these people that come out that are Rogan people, the church of what's happening now. People they expect a certain fucking type of behavior. Okay, <laughs> they can fucking go all out. Half the people in that room were on edibles. That's Good. why they went for the fucking ride last night. They You're were the only mook that was sitting there like a fucking orphan in the back of the bus. You they weren't on that edible. Listen, I'm fuck opening that. this up. It's the body of Christ. Yeah, right? fuck, yeah, I'm Jewish. And I'm going to give you a Good. little piece. That's even more fucking the right to nope. do it. No, nope. no. You think there's a Jew in America that would turn down? Yeah. If I went to Israel right now and I said, I got a two-strength edible, they'd stop throwing No, they haven't rocks. worked with you for two years and even have been given an edible by you that made them puke. 
They don't, bro, you puke that fucking morning because you don't put nothing in your breakfast, in your tummy. I tell you, I call you up and I go, put something in your fucking tummy, like Captain Crunch or something. I don't give a fuck what it is because well, he eats this shit fucking straight with Coca-Cola and water, like Papillon on a fucking island. You can't do that shit. You got to prepare yourself. You got to eat a fruit, maybe a little fuck. No cheese because the cheese holds on to the fucking edible. Oh, great. I ate so eight let, pounds of cheese this morning, man. Well, perfect. Let's, <laughs> let's fucking eat an edible and make it a beautiful day to be alive. Also, I got a couple emails about us doing a, a, a podcast on Monday. Listen, when there's a tragedy or a bad situation, what do you want to do? Sit around and fucking talk about it like ABC News and make you feel worse about it and make you feel where you're at? My job, Lee's job, our job is to have a fucking good time. It's very tough to have a good time with under a tragedy or some situation, but you try. Just because somebody dies in your family or whatever don't mean you stop dying. Number two, people make comments to me about Joey, how can you say that, that, uh, you know, when you go out, uh, listen, one thing about me is I know how fast your life could change. Mm -hmm. Your life lead could change in a matter of fucking seconds. You know, you could be at a bar having a beer and the guy next to you pulls a fucking gun out. It's that fucking easy. Next thing you know, you got shot in the fucking leg and you can't walk for a fucking year because you were at a stupid fucking bar. I seen it happen. Yeah. I, you know, when I was 15, I, I, you know, I had the world by the balls. I mean, I still got the motherfucking world by the balls at 50, but when you're 15, buy a, oh my God. a little fucking protein fart there for the masses. I'm going to have to throw that chair away. <laughs> Ooh. That's a good one because it came right out. It bounced off the chair and came right in between the microphone. Right now, smell your speakers. You can probably smell it. It's coming through. What was I talking about? Like, oh, about stuff. Can life happen. changes, yeah. man. Life fucking changes in a minute. Within a fucking minute. Within a minute. You, that's why you got to hug people. That's why you got to be nice to people because you never know when they're going to get a car, get on the fucking 101 and get hit by a fucking truck. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It could happen. It could happen. You know, I was right there when I came home from my mother dead on the fucking floor. And your life changes forever. So please, excuse my comments. What I was saying was every time I go to a big event, you got to sit there and go to yourself. Is somebody in here going to pick up and fucking get a gun and shoot us? Or is somebody going to put a fucking bomb out? And, you know, it's like you always think that's not going to happen to me. Yeah. Because in the back of our minds when we go out, and that's a positive way to fucking think. I think the same way. But the reality of it is it could happen to you. And then today it can happen to you in a fucking supermarket. Yeah. You know, there's times I go to a fucking supermarket, I look at the price of fucking shrimp or something like that. I'm about to shoot <laughs> some fucking body. You know what I'm saying? I look at the price of the, the shit they're banging you out for, plane tickets. You know, it, it's a no-end situation. And for some people, it, it just getting squeezed. Like that movie with Michael Douglas when he lost it and hit the people with the bat remember years ago? No. The one about L.A. You never seen that movie? He was stuck in L.A. traffic and he just left his car on the tent. No, and really. On the way home, they tried to mug him, and he beats up the drug dealer. It's called uh, who the fuck knows? Let me look it up. Breaking loose or fucking losing it or something like that. You know what the fuck do you watch? What do you fucking watch all your life? I, I bad fucking movies. Well, for for the first fucking fifteen years of it, yeah. yeah. Not, not not everyone can go see the fucking Godfather when you're ten, and then do a hit of THC. What's the difference? But what? what, what, what <laughs> Where the fuck you been? What's Michael Douglas's movie? I'm looking for it. Hold on. The one, it's uh, 94, 93, 92. Is it Falling Down? Falling fucking down, where he lives in L.A., and he's a nerdy fucking dude, and he snaps, because it's true. People can fucking snap anywhere, and they can get pushed over the edge at the library. They can get pushed over the edge at Rouse. They get pushed. Who would have fucking thought the Boston Marathon? Who would have fucking thought? No. Nobody. Yeah. So, people, just keep your eyes out. Know that everything could change and just be the best that you fucking can be. That's fucking it. Plain and simple. That's what I meant to say. Sometimes yeah. I'm high. Where's that fucking edible, Lee? I don't know. You fucking have it. Jesus Christ. <laughs> but, uh, no, it, it was, it's been crazy. So, uh, it's crazy week. And my heart goes out for the people in Boston that are tougher than this. And they all know, you know, this motherfucker, the people that are doing this. Whatever. Life goes on, man. There's always a bad fucking bunch of fucking douchebags involved. And this is what happens. You know, sneaky motherfuckers, for the love of what? To kill an eight-year-old boy? I mean, what, what the fuck are we going down to? But you just have to be alert. Love your people every day because everything can change in a drop of a fucking hat. That's what I'm talking about. Wait, what the fuck are we talking about here? A little back to the hotel, Lee. I want to say you wiggle. I want to see you do something, Lee cocksucker. If you can go to the NoHo organic sign up there, they got half fates for 20 fucking dollars. 
half eights for twenty fucking dollars. No whole organic, divine wellness on Lancashire. You can't go fucking wrong. You people, where do you get your edibles from? For no whole organic, I get these for ten bucks a piece. At no whole organic, and they're double strength. At divine wellness, they got the four fucking strength. The ones that help you see Jesus or <laughs> Satan, whichever one you fucking buy. If you buy the black one, you see Satan. If you buy the white one, you see Jesus. Oh, you gave me the black one last time, didn't you? Fuck yeah, yeah I don't fuck, fuck around. You. That's why you see the devil. And guess what, bitch? You're gonna see the devil again today if you're gonna go to Las Vegas anyway. No man, God in Las Vegas. <laughs> Anyway, what the fuck you get me talking about for? But yeah, you walked out of there like it was a like a grocery bag, like normal people get from the fucking <laughs> like for food. You had like eighteen things in there. You're like, did this guy give me my eighth? He, oh yeah, he gave me my eighth. I go in there, I get <laughs> thirty, forty dollars. They give me twenty five fucking things. They give me two joints, a couple of edibles, a chocolate bar. You know these people, are good people. Jay, the guy that runs that place, got another one in Woodland Hills. They're fucking good people. You know, I I, I build a bond with my fucking. At the reefer stores I go. There's a lot of mutts out there. They got no loyalty. And they go to all these places looking for a free pipe. Well, who's going to give you an extra tent? I'd rather build the fucking relationship with the guy and have no beefs. I got a great relationship. How fast was I in and out of there? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. They see me fucking in the light and they just start putting the best shit in their shovels. A fucking ear. I was just laughing because you have the like the most regimented schedule I've ever seen. Every day you go it's weed store, comedy club, seven eleven for hot chocolate and a fucking uh, e cigarette and you're back home. <laughs> like I don't fuck around. No. I have listen, uh, it's so funny. I was thinking about uh, Anthony Hopkins. What, what's that guy's name? Anthony Robbins. You ever go to an Anthony Robbins seminar? No. You know, I remember being I'm working at a car dealership and they wanted to maximize Potential when I was in college, so I went to two years in a row. I went to those Anthony Robbins where you walk on coals and oh wow, you jump and I up didn't and think down. You did that. I didn't, dog. I didn't do it. They <laughs> paid me to do it, so I went for a few days. And I smoked some pot, you know. I go down and talk to the people, and you learn some positive things. And I thought it was all bullshit, but he had a couple things that he did. You know, it really, really, I, I understand. But me, I don't believe in self help books or self help gurus. You know, we we live in the times of iPhone. I, I fucking know the answer to how I could get better. We just don't want to accept it. You know what I'm saying? So I used to go to all You didn't know that, Lee? Mm-mm. You didn't know I was one of those fucking nerds? You never said that. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to be. Everybody's looking to get better, the better than fucking selves, especially when you're 21, 22. That was right before that. In fact, I went to the last Anthony Robbins. I went to, I kidnapped Vela the month afterward. Jesus. So he put me on point to kidnap fucking Vela. That's why I look at it. So I could have gone to court and said Anthony Robbins made me do it. But I got more balls than that because I claim responsibility. Let's get it in the fucking air before. I, I don't like coming on this podcast, especially in the morning, and getting fired up in a, in a, in a weird way. The reason why I do the fucking podcast with Lee is to play some music and get high and talk about the goodness in the fucking day and how you're going to go out there and make it happen for yourself. I'm serious. Mm -hmm. You know, me and Lee do it. Like Lee just said, as unregimented as stoned I am, I am to the fucking T. I have a notebook in my house. And every morning before I leave, I open that notebook and it breaks the day down to me. Mm -hmm. So if you call me and you really say to me, where are you? Where are you going to be at 1238 today? Once I look at that notebook, I can tell you that morning, that day. That's how I want my day to be. Yeah. I have to sit up between 10 and 4. So I got to go to Hollywood. So I got to run a bunch of shit. Ari wants to meet 11. I don't even think I can meet Ari. I didn't know until I went home last night. Because most of my shit is on the other side of fucking L.A. If you don't have your day that planned, you're in no fucking danger of moving ahead. You got to have your day fucking planned. But to get something out of the way here. Uh, what the fuck is it? A lot of things happened last week. One of the things that happened was I got mad at a particular fucking podcast. And a lot of people have been asking me what happened. Well, we did with that fucking moron. I'm not going to give him any light. I'm not going to give people any fucking light on this thing. And that's why I hate starting a podcast off. But you guys are loyal listeners, and I owe you a fucking apology for tweeting that way. And I also owe you an apology because I didn't want you to see that side of me. What happens in my life is this, Okay. There's two things you got to do in your life if you want to get a fucking head. And this ain't me preaching. I'm just telling you because I went through everything. I read every fucking self-help book. I went to Anthony Robbins. I made my confirmation at 28. Did you know that, Lee? No. I had more fucking problems than anybody. So I know what it's like. To, 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 to. And the one thing that made my life so much smoother by 80% Lee was claiming responsibility for my actions. Yeah. And not being such a pussy about my actions. I.e., 
I didn't do it. I don't do nothing. Okay? When the cops come, that's what I tell the cops. But when a good friend like Lee comes up to me, or a person that's striving for you, and you try to fucking chuck and jive around them, people will never trust you again. No. I have a weird thing with people. If you chuck and jive around me, you want to chuck and jive around me, that's great. But when it comes to business, we cannot do it. I agreed to do a podcast. Lee and I showed up. We did the podcast. The podcast went up. It was a very gr- good podcast part of it because I was high <laughs> to the fucking gills with Lee. I got sizzled here with Lee. That's why the podcast was real. Everything I fucking talk about these things is real. And I want people to understand the mind frame when you live in LA. It's not, <laughs> we're at the fucking bar drinking with my friends. No. You got to give people the illusion of that. You're doing comedy. You're writing jokes. You're doing all this shit, you know? So I do this podcast. They put it up. They hit me. But I noticed that they were doing little things before that that were kind of weird. They were sending me emails to retweet shit for Eddie Bravo and all this shit. They're friends, but you know what? If you do your own marketing, you don't need other people to fucking retweet shit for you. Nothing bothers me more than when I go to some of these pages and I see 15 fucking retweets. What, don't you have a fucking personality of your own? Don't you have anything to fucking say on your own? But some people are shy or whatever. No worries. The podcast comes out that day on the thing. I see that they're hitting friends of mine. Okay, like Bert Kreischer retweet this for Joe Diaz. This guy retweet this for Joe Diaz. Right away, that's a fucking no-no in my book. Okay, do your own marketing. They went to, then they started going to people that I'm not cool with. Like, I'm not cool with them. Why would you go to them and say, retweet this for fucking Joe Diaz without fucking asking me? So what do I do? I see that they're doing on the two different Twitter handles. So I contact that fucking cunt that runs the podcast. He contacts me back with this distant email that it's his interns that did it, that he's sorry. I go out that night, I come back. They got a different Twitter account doing it in a different way. Mentioning the guy's name. Hey, you did great on this podcast. Like, they don't know that I don't know what a new fucking fake Twitter account looks like. Like, they think I just fell off the fucking boat. I go to bed. I don't do that. I send them an email. Hey, guy, I come here to do the podcast Wednesday morning. I, as I'm doing the fucking podcast, I'm looking at the feed, and he's going to people that I know, asking them to be guests on my show. That is why I got angry. You don't do that to people. He was going out to Jim Norton and people like that. And I'm not even that cool with. I just know through comedy, hello and goodbye. So you cannot do that to people. Instead of this guy sending me an email going, bro, I'm sorry, I'm looking for guests. He keeps telling me it's his fucking interns. That's what I got pissed off about. Because claim responsibility. Even till today, he put up a YouTube video on Monday. Saying that it was his fucking interns. That guy, you never want to do business with a guy like that. That cannot claim responsibility. That is a pussy. That's the type of guy that will leave you in a fucking lurch. He's never gotten back to me. If all he had to do was write me an email and say, Dog, I fucked up. I really want the podcast. Now, what does he get? He has nothing. Can't contact Rogan. Can't contact me. Can't contact anybody in our fucking circle. They're supposed to be putting up... <clears throat> somebody from Dead Squad podcast next week that's going down too then they tried to be fucking cute and set up two more accounts and asked me yesterday to put it back up like this guy has no fucking idea that as soon as he fucking contacted me as soon as his beef was going down I got 30 people that listened to that podcast that told me the guy was a puke that got rid of his fucking partner then I got a call from an attorney. I got a two twitch from an attorney that said all they need is the fucking word to terrorize them. Then I got fucking twitch from gangsters in London that said <laughs> to get their fucking address and then break their fucking legs. So if you're listening or if you're watching, if you're friends of these cunts, explain to them. They can get it from every fucking direction. And the reason why I haven't gone after them in a real fuck, because I'm a fucking old school gangster. I'll shut them down Twitter way. I'll shut them down smart. I know fucking, all I got to do is make two fucking phone calls to a buddy of mine on YouTube, and he'll do whatever the fuck he wants for us. I just don't ask him, because I don't want to fucking impose on him. But you understand me? Why fuck around? Why fuck around with people that could help you or just be fucking really cool to you? Especially after I say something to you. Yeah. That's when it shuts down. Once I say something to you and I look at you like a man, that's when you go, oh, I get who I'm dealing with here. I'll act like a fucking man. No. Six days later, this fucking cunt of a fag of a man, because he's weak, still puts out a YouTube video. That's his fucking interns. This is the guy we're dealing with. 
That nerdy little motherfucker with his little cunty fucking girl. That's who we're fucking dealing with here. So, if you know somebody like that in your life, or if you have that quality, that you can't assume responsibility, look somebody in the face and go, hey, guess what, bro? I'm a fucking sinner. I fucked up. Shoot yourself. Because it ain't gonna get no better for you. Trust me. At 28, I ended up in fucking prison. If I didn't claim responsibility for my actions, I wouldn't be here in front of you right now. Because with stand-up, you gotta claim responsibility eventually. If not, they'll fucking eat you up. Yeah, didn't you say the judge wasn't gonna give you as much time, but you didn't claim responsibility? Yeah, so, yeah. So that's, that, that's not only for this situation. Like, especially at work or at school, if, if, if you don't, like, let's say you don't turn in, like, a paper or something. If you just say, oh, like, if you're trying to make excuses, but if you, if you just say, like, listen, I was late, or at work you messed up, there's not really anything anyone can say after that when you just say sorry. So, like, it doesn't have to even be for this podcast. If you just uh, take responsibility, people really can't say shit after that. No, it's, 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 it's ruined me. It's ruined my relationship with people. Especially after like 33. Once somebody can't say to me, da, 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 I, I can't deal with it. Yeah. Listen, let me tell you how fucking perverse and disgusting I am. <laughs> Whenever somebody does something bad, I claim responsibility. That's the type of guy I am in the back of my mind. Because I, do you understand me? Because that's where I came from. For, for a while, everything that happened was me. And I would always deny, or oh, there was always a reason. Mm-hmm. There's always a reason about the way. Listen, man, our parents aren't watching. You're not going to get beat up no more. Nobody's going to smack you in the fucking mouth. Nobody's going to punch you. Nobody's going to do nothing to you. Just come to. But this isn't about coming to grips with people. This is about coming to grips with yourself and being honest with yourself. You know how many times I get off stage and I'm like, Lee, that wasn't one of my good sets. And you're like, that was. No, I know I was dead. If I don't put that belief in myself, I'm never going to move forward. So this isn't even about the people around you. It all starts with the belief in yourself. And to be honest with yourself and go, you know what? I got to get on stage more. I got to do these things more. I got to go to the gym more. I got to be nicer to my wife. I got to do all these things more. That catches you. And that's claiming responsibility. And that's all I ever wanted from anybody. I don't want money. I don't want friendship. If you do that around me, we'll always be fucking cool. Yeah. No, it's it's a, and it's a tough thing to do because I mean, all that guy is, is excited about his podcast and he wants people to see it and but he, the way to go that's not the way to that go about it. The way to go about it. Yeah, there's a way to do things. There's a way not to do things. He would have been cool with me from the jump. If he would have said, "Bro, don't worry about it. Hey, man, do me a favor. Can you hit up this guy or that guy to be on your podcast?" I would have said, "Let me try for you." But for you to and then to blame it on your fucking interns and then on Monday to keep blaming it on your interns. It does something to you. It, 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 to me, I'm as sensitive as they fucking come. You see me big and fuck you and all this dog. I cry at the side of a fucking hat. Okay. And I get very unsensitive with people. In my de- demented mind, I think you're fucking with me. Okay. I think you're fucking with in me. In what way? Let's break it out in the fucking open. You came to me about a year ago and you said, dog, when you put a podcast out on Fridays... It goes nowhere. Start releasing them on Thursday. You were talking about me and Felicia and Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. I told Felicia that 50 times. And she would release the thing on Saturdays. So in the back of my mind, you're fucking with me. You're mm-hmm. fucking with me. That's what you're doing to me. You're really like trying to make a fucking jerk off out of me. That's what you're fucking trying to do to me. After we've had this conversation. Ten fucking times that it, nothing comes out on Friday. So if you're going to release the podcast, release the podcast from Thursday, whatever. I don't give a fuck. You release at 11.50 fucking night on Thursday night. Mm-hmm. Do not release it after Friday because people don't download it. Saturday at 6 o'clock, I would get a link that she just released it. So in my mind, you're fucking with me. I can't say nothing to nobody because right away you're being that. You understand me? Yeah. And that's the biggest thing why, why we've worked together for so long because both of us We'll do it what we say when we're going to do it. Do it. Done. Done. Do it. and get. When you got to do something, do it and get it over with. You sitting around contemplating. When I got to do something in the morning, dog, this time's I'm fucking wiped out. You know, last night, my biggest apologies to everybody. I didn't stick around last night. After the Rogan set, I couldn't stick around. I'll tell you what happens on fucking Tuesdays, Lee. I go for acupuncture. They do the cupping. They do the whole fucking thing. Yeah. You know. I drink a ton of water. Not only that, I went to the Y yesterday. 
that I go do comedy, I get home. Like we were talking about, our goal as comics is to drive to stay up. Yeah. Even if I'm fucking home, even if I'm at home at 11.15, my job is to spark a joint, uh, get a cup of coffee going, and try to stay up till 3 or 4 being <laughs> genius, writing jokes about Copernicus, make him believe I'm something special, which I'm fucking not. And I can't do it. I'm an old fucking man. I'm 50. I got to be in fucking bed. I got to be in fucking bed. I got to get six hours. If I don't get six hours before I come see you cocksuckers on Mondays and Wednesdays, this shit don't work. I'm a fucking half of, you know, or I'll give you a great show, and then I got to go home and take a nap and sleep on my business hours, which yeah. I want to be alert for. I want to be writing. I want to be something, you know, cohesive, whatever the fucking word is. So I suffer somewhere. I used to go to the special room on Tuesday nights, and they put me up last. I get, I get home at 11, fucking 10 to 12. You got to go back to doing stand-up at 10 to 12. That means you're going to bed at fucking 1. That means you're done. I got to get up at 4.45 to come over here and see you. Yeah. I'm not going to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'll get away with it. I'm not going to say, dog, I used to get away on no sleep. I'd do a fucking a half a rock of fucking blow, and I wouldn't sleep and come down here. What's the fucking difference, you know? Yeah. But then somewhere along the line, your day suffers. You're not going to give your full attention to something. You know, I may have a show tonight. I may want to go to kickboxing. That'll be ruined. Because I didn't sleep at night. So that's why I leave. I try to get that six, seven hours from fucking prepared for you, cocksuckers, today. If not, we got fucking nothing, Lee. You know what I'm saying? We got nothing, cocksucker. I got it. What's up, baby boy? <laughs> Proud of you. Look at you you're going to Vegas. You're going to bang off some fucking dough. You're going to get your stomach or something today. Well, we're going to try. Yeah. You're going to try to get your little stomach or something? Fuck yeah. All right, let's eat this out of the little stuff. Fuck you, inedible. Cocksucker. Well, gee, well, gee. I don't care what you say. You can replace me. Do whatever you want. Fuck you, that you edible. You can do what? You can do what? I said, fuck that edible. Listen, I'll fucking tie you up and drop you off at the 170. And we got a call. Oh, shit. What's happening, beautiful? Hey, how you doing? How are you, my friend? Is this my man DC in the house? Yeah, how you doing? How are you, friend? Good, good, good. I don't know what time. I don't know, because I have 934. I forgot to call a little earlier, you know? Nah, you're cool, man. I'm happy you did. You're not busy over there today? No, no, I, you know, kind of with this thing with my mom, I, I'm kind of, kind of taking a day here and there now, just to kind of, kind of get my head together, you know. I hear you. On the phone is, uh, I don't even know what to call you, Danny, because I didn't speak to you really till a couple of weeks ago. Is a, a, a fucking idol of mine, Danny Calandrillo. <laughs> I'm serious. You know, I really thought about how to describe you, and uh, you know, I will just start with. You know, we have a big sports audience here, and uh, Danny played for Seton Hall. He, he played for the high school I attended, North Bergen High, and he, and he went on to Seton Hall. He was the Big East player of the year, led the nation in scoring, uh, got drafted, whatever, but we're here. And uh, Danny, you're, you're just a great story, man. Oh, uh, thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, when I was in the seventh grade, I got left back, and I got put in Barone's class. Not Joe, John's, you know, the Joe's. And uh, I became a basketball nut. And I knew about you, but I didn't know exactly. And I used to go watch you. And, you know, at one point, uh, uh, basketball was my savior. And, and you were my savior. I'd go watch you practice, and then I'd go try the move down at 38th Street <laughs> Court or whatever. Uh, you know, Danny, people talk all this shit. And I'm really sorry. Danny lost his mother last week. So, Danny, I'm, I'm really happy that you got to even call, uh, you know, uh, God bless her. You know, you came from a family with 13 kids. Uh, I mean, you came from North Bergen over by 80th Street there. How did you get so good in basketball? Well, you know, you know, growing up where we grew up, it was, it was there was no one. You know, we we you know, I was in a four story walk up like everybody, and uh, you know, it was just outside. You know, nothing. Everything was created outside. There was nothing. There was nothing for you to do inside, a, you know, a railroad apartment. So uh, I think most of the guys I grew up with were just consistently outside, you know, playing basketball, playing sports, go home, eat. You know, where, when back in the day when when families sat down and had dinner, when their father came home, because my father was old school Italian, and then after that you were free to do your thing. So everybody was just playing consistently, you know, and I just kind of. You know, I had my mentors and my idols, Jackie Galoon and, you know, Michael Corrin and Spinalco and, and Jimmy Boylan. You know, these guys were legends in Hudson County. And I just, you know, I, I told my kids the other day, I just put my head down until I think my senior year at Seton Hall. Then I, I kind of realized what I accomplished. 
You know, uh, Danny, for me, it wasn't the points or the, you know, going to Hashway and seeing Digger Phelps there trying to recruit you or any of that. It was just letting me know that I could do it, which is, uh, that's the biggest thing you could do for a person, you know. Uh, you weren't black. You weren't six foot eight. You didn't have a 92-inch vertical fucking jump. You did everything, you know, you were six one. You did everything the old fucking fashion way. I mean, I told you a story that you never remembered. I remember my eighth grade year, my whole life was basketball. All I wanted to do was start freshman year, and I used to hang out with Anthony Sinsulo. And he was, uh, you know, he was right there in the backcourt with you. One day, we took our bikes to 76th Street Courts there by Our Lady Fatima, by Hashways, and we were playing at one in the morning, three-point games. It was you, me, and the model from Guttenberg, Nikki DeLucia or Nikki DeSeglia? Seglia, yeah. Seglia. We were playing, and I remember going home, my head almost blew up, that I got to cover you. That's it. <laughs> like, you beat me three to one or something, or three nothing, but I got to cover you. And I went home with this air of confidence. This was my fucking life, you know, and I watched, uh, you know, all your games. I, it was just, a, I remember taking a bus with Chucky McBreen and Whitey O'Donnell to fucking Broomfield to watch you against Kelly Trapuca and just, uh, wow. You know, I bumped into Tommy Heinsohn last year in Atlanta at a, at, a, at, a, at a hotel. He he was doing some game. He was covering the Celtics were playing some uh, the Atlanta Hawks, obviously. And I even talked to him, and it's something about the Hudson County guys because I went to I played for St. Michael's CYO, so I heard all the stories about him. Then I had you in Northburg. It was just amazing to have you, Danny. And uh, uh, no, no, I, I appreciate that. I remember I reminded you about an article that I had cut out about you that the big movie at the time was a basketball movie with Robbie Benson called One on One. And this writer did a comparison about a, a guy going to a big college and getting lost and you didn't want that to happen. That's why you chose Seton Hall close to home with Bill Raftery and stuff. I mean, what were you thinking at all this time? Like, you, you broke all these records. What were you thinking about in high school? Well, you know, I just want to... You know, I guess, we, you know, going to grammar school, playing high school, high school, you know, I just wanted to go to college. And then, you know, watching you know, Corin and Spinaco going uh, into the NCAA tournament. And then, you know, Jimmy Boyle and Marquette, I, I signed with them when they won a national championship. Al McGuire came to my house, and I was kind of done. You know, I was like, I'm done. I'm going to kind of... I was, I was always a year or two ahead of myself. I think that was my strength. It was just like, okay... And when I went to college, you know, I, I my dad was dying. Marquette let me out of my, their scholarship. So, to be honest with you, I was in a restaurant in Hudson County with Matty Pickenich, my best friends, and uh, and him walks this guy Bill Raftery, and you know, I was he was from the heart. He was just pure. He was uh, genuine, and uh, to this day, you know, we talk every day, and it's uh, for me. It was the best choice. You know, I had Matty Sabello, who was the godfather to my son, and in high school, RAF, and uh, in college. And then when I was in college, I was like, I'm done. I just want to go to either the NBA or go to Europe. And, and I did it. You know, I got played a little bit with the Rockets, got cut, and then I got a call to go to uh, Italy. And my first game was against Mike D'Antonio, which is the funniest thing in the world. And he's like, who are you? You know, what, what, what's your Italian? What, you know? So he, he actually kind of took me under his wing and, uh, guided me in, in Italy about, you know, who to talk to, how to get your passport. So, and it's funny, you know, when he was the Nick coach, we talked here and there. Now I haven't obviously talked to him since he's the Laker coach, but uh, I think with basketball, you just meet people that kind of attract to each other. They're either great people or they're not, and I was fortunate to always attract to really good people. I mean, uh, I, I used to go to Kennedy School to play. You don't have to have that league, you know, McKinley plays Kennedy. And I would just stare at your eighth grade picture. You know, <laughs> you and you had Danny Rugar, that was his name, right? Danny Rugar was the coach in Canada. Larry Rugar, yeah. Larry Rugar. I remember that motherfucker, he was up like 90 <laughs> to 10 one game against like Lincoln B. Because there was some grammar school, I think Robert Fulton was so big, they had two uh, teams. They had A and B. The A was the eighth grade and B was the seventh grade. Rugar was up like 90 to 10 and he was still full court pressing in the, in the third <laughs> quarter. <laughs> You know, these are the yeah. fucking people that we had. Uh, and you were around some characters. I mean, I used to go watch your practices with, you know who I still, uh, who I did a benefit for a few years ago? Ralph Marino. 
Ah, uh, Ralphie's the best, yeah. You know, Ralphie would sit there at all the practices and coach Sabello, and I'd watch you guys, and it was... Uh, but it's weird how you, your family affected me in two ways. You know, you let me know that I could play basketball, that it was part, you know, I remember being in the seventh grade and watching Old Corn in the national championship against Marquette. And that Saturday, he drilled home 31 fucking points against Glenn Gondrzejczyk. Remember that? I mean, yeah. and yeah. just seeing that he was from Jersey City, let me fucking know that, Jesus Christ, I could do this. I went to Superstar Basketball Camp with uh, Hurley. You know, and he wanted me to go to St. Anthony's, me and Whitey and Lee Irwin. Lee Irwin was a six foot five kid from Franklin that broke his leg in the eighth grade, never played basketball again. Uh wow. and I ended, we ended up going to 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 North Bergen, but you know, you let me know I can do basketball. Then something else happened in your family. One of your brothers got into this business, you know, the entertainment business, and he landed uh spring break and he landed a fucking huge movie with uh uh, the idol break, the idol maker, and I remember yeah. seeing his picture on the wall at Hashways, and going for the love of fucking yeah. Christ, these Calandrillos, they're everywhere. They're like Puerto Ricans. These guys can do it all. <laughs> <laughs> they can do it fucking all. I'll these guys. You, my brother Paul, really, he uh, always hustled, always worked. It was a roofer. You know, it was a really good-looking guy. I got discovered at Studio Fifty Four. You know, I never forget. You know, I, w- I was there with him uh, one night and. The next day, he's like, Danny, I got to go into the city. Some agency called me. I said, for what? He's like, they want me to model. I'm like, model model what? So he went in, and then they're like, look, they want me to go to France. So he, he lived in Champs-Élysées for uh, three or four years. He was the top model in Europe. He got discovered over there, and that's how, you know, they were looking to do a movie on Frankie Avalon. And uh, so... You know, he met uh, Peter Gallagher and Ray Shockey. It was they were young, and and uh, I was out there when I was filming it. And he was lucky. He was always humble. He was always uh, never forgot where he came from. You know, after his movie thing was over, he came back had a couple of kids, started his own little roofing business. So I get Hudson County, and I teach just that you know I coach at Holy Cross and Rumson that look, it doesn't matter where you're from, who's your mother, who's your father, but if you're committed and you work hard and you're diligent and you're accountable. You know, it doesn't matter if you're from Hudson County or from Monmouth County, but it takes a lot to accomplish uh, to be a, just a Division One player. You know, you were uh, amazing, Danny. I used to go to those Friday night games, and uh, I still remember playing against Hoboken your senior year. How Hoboken had this tremendous team. They had this, you know, six foot five. They led Hudson County in slamming and slam dunks. And you guys went down and beat them in Hoboken, the old-fashioned way. Boys, yeah, the boys and Noah, the two two D one guys. Oh my God, you guys went and beat them by diving and biting and fucking making free throws, and you know, and it was uh, just amazing the things you did. I never forgot you. I never forgot your name, brother. And uh, I'm really happy that you called today. I always wanted to tell you that that you brought my fucking dreams to life, or your family did, you know. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, it's it's. Uh, I always try to tell a kid, go out, be great. You know, every my parents, you know, were always go for it, be the best. You know, how can I be? How can you be the best in a four story walk up? But there's kids out there that are going to make it. They're going to be writers and actors, and uh, you know, hopefully a president. And 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 then the coaches. I was fortunate, like I try to do with kids. I push them, guide them, love them, tough love and. And then that's all you need because some parents just will never be there and some parents will just, you know, be there too much. And then some will do the right thing. Like my son Daniel played at Bryant, D1, walked on, got a scholarship. You know, I mean, it's the way it is. Um, But I think the trait that you're talking about in Hudson County, maybe it's in Staten Island or Brooklyn, I don't know, but in Hudson County, all you got to do is just talk to somebody. And when they know you're from that area, the conversation just gets loose. In which way? What do you mean? Because that's happened to me, but describe it for these people. Well, you know, like the other day I was looking, you know, we're trying to do a whole thing, a small complex, and uh, down here in Monmouth County, you know, something I always dreamed of doing, it was my goal in life, just to be around kids, coach kids, and, and just, you know, try to help them what I learned along the way. And, you know, I'm looking at this one place, and this guy's pretty hard-nosed, and he's giving us a hard time, and I just said to the guy, look, what, what's the story? What's your problem? 
you know, we're, we're considering buying something and this and that. And then I, I said, where are you from? And he's like, I'm from Jersey City. I said, I'm from North Bergen. That was it. The tone, the, the conversation changed. Oh, my God. And, oh, my God, you're Dan Cameron. Oh, my God, Corin And then, oh, remember Jackie Galo? And it was like, <laughs> but first, there was a lot of tension. But, you know, once somebody knew that, hey, I was from the same cloth, uh, things changed. So It's amazing what it's done for me being from North Bergen because I never forgot it. You know, I'm a Cuban kid, and when my mom died, those kids, uh, they took me in. You know, Danny, and then I had my heart set on playing freshman basketball. That's all I wanted to do was just start, and I didn't get along with Rhiannon. And after that, things went a different direction, and I stopped playing. I never really stopped playing. I just stopped. I didn't think Sabello liked me, you follow? So I never gave it a chance. In reality, I really gave up. And it's something that fucks with me till today, Danny, that I didn't uh, go after. I've said to myself, I'm five foot nine. I'm Cuban. I could jump, but I can't run fast. What the fuck am I going to do? And uh, that uh, taught me a lesson. A lot, you know what I'm saying? As you look back, you, you know, I mean, uh, you know, horrendous call me and, you know, people like about you. And, you know, like, uh, I'm proud of you. Like, everybody, no, the, the road's not easy for anybody. And but where you are in your life right now, and, you know, I've, had some success on Wall Street, it doesn't matter. My goal is, to, you know, are you a good person? Uh, my mom just passed, and she was the nicest soul on the planet. You know, I didn't have a dime to her, but, you know, what she affected so many people. So I think, you know, as I get older, money and profession, whatever you do, really does, it means nothing. I know Ben Howland real well, one, one of the nicest men I've ever met in my life. Great coach, makes a lot of money, beautiful family, but as a person, He's the kind of guy I would hang out with. Now, I don't, I don't know. I can't say that about too many other guys, but Bill Raftery and, and, and Ben Allen, like the nicest people in the world. It's amazing what we go through in our lives. And, uh, Danny, I always thought about you. I, I couldn't believe how much of an inspiration you are when I spoke to her. And, you know, I went to five-star basketball camp with Horrenda's brother on the bus. <laughs> with Greg Horrenda. We, when his parents took us into 42nd Street, Port Authority, we went upstairs and we took the bus to Five Star. I mean, it was my life. I mean, uh, it's amazing when you dedicate yourself to something. And I didn't, and what I learned, what I didn't do in basketball, Danny, I didn't stand up comedy. That's awesome. The failure I didn't stand in basketball for not, you know, I took a, I ran into a bump in the wall and I got off the fucking bike. I made sure that didn't happen with stand up comedy. But I dove into it with the same tenacity. You know, like we talked about. I put that fucking basketball up in that 10-speed, Danny, and I take that bike from 88th Street Park to 16th Park to 16th Street to Gilmore to play with Dracula. You know what? You remember the kid from Union City, Nunzio? Yeah. You know Nunzio's brother is the kid on The Office? Get out of here, The really? Spanish kid on The Office, Nestor? Yeah. That's Nunzio's brother. Come on, my, really? my mother. Because I didn't know he was a good player. Yeah, my mother had a bar on 29th Street in Burger Line from the 50s when they came from Cuba, and there used to be a hot dog stand on 30th Street, right there by Chappie's Florist. It's the last place you could take a bus in Union City before it hits New York City, and I would play basketball down in Union City with Nunzi, although they were older than I was. But one day we're out here, and again, I go to an audition. Some Spanish kids being a dick to me. And all of a sudden he goes, you Cuban? I go, you Cuban? Yeah, yeah, where are you from? Union City, I'm from North Bergen. Fucking conversation changed. And he's Nestor from The Office, the Spanish kid on The Office. That, that is that is amazing. It is, uh, you know who else is from Union City? I didn't know the guy that was on uh, Boardwalk Empire. Empire this year. Do you watch that show? I don't really watch it a lot. I, yeah, here and there, here and there. I forget what the kid's name. He's a popular actor. He He went to Union Hill too. It's amazing the people that I've met out here. You know who's from Union City? It's Joey Cassaro. Now he's Joey with the hair out there. He's on Rodeo Drive. Joey Cassaro. Yeah. Little Joey. His, his name is Joey something now. Famous name. He's right on Rodeo Drive. You should definitely look him up. And, and he, uh, cut, he cuts hair or something. Yeah. He cut my, well, my brother Paul and him were best friends. His, his brother Vinny and my sister dated for years. And when my brother died, I called Joey. I went out there, and he freaked out. Freaked out. My brother used to protect him. 
my brother protected him. My brother was an airborne ranger, and uh, no one messed with Joe. And when my brother died, I called him. I called Peter Galva. I told you this the other day, and Peter was almost crying. You know, they were so close. And uh, it's funny that, you know, you look, you know, who made it or whatever, but Joey's never forgotten either. He's very successful out there. I think he's got, like, 50 salons or something. Something crazy out there. No, it, man, listen, it's what keeps me alive is from reminding me of North Bergen. It keeps me fucking going. Everything I do, I do with North Bergen in the back of my mind because I always want to succeed for them. As a little city that it is, you know. Uh, I'm going to Miami this week for the South Beach Comedy Festival. And you know who will be there, Dan? Steve Mako, the son to Joe Mako. Wow. You know, uh... It's it's going to be a, a great little time I'm going down there because half of North Bergen lives in Miami now. Yeah, you were saying that. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach. It's amazing. All the people that will pop up that you, you, you forgot about, you know, over the years. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. That That's why I do that run because I get to see a lot of people out of their element. And uh, But I got to tell you, Danny, just this whole experience talking to you the last couple of weeks has really uh, made me aware of where I came from and uh, just, you know, you never gave up and I really respect it and I want to thank you for being there when I was a kid and I know a lot of people who felt like that, even Whitey O'Donnell, we were your fucking little, uh, whatever you call it. what do you call it when a rock band has people who follow them? Entourage? <laughs> yeah, we were not even your entourage, we were your Rupees, groupies. we were Dan Calandrillo groupies the crossover, uh, the dirty foot uh, You shots. guys are great kids, you guys are great kids, I always, you know, I see Whitey here and there and you know, he always tried to pal around with us, and we gave him tough love. We beat him up, but uh, you know, years later, I saw him, his wife, and his, I guess I think he had a daughter at the time. And uh, I think he was amazed because, like that whole team, we won a state championship. We were so close. You know, Maddie was my best friend. Louis, we we had like you know Italians, Irish, Puerto Ricans, Cubans, Havlicek, Havlicek's nephew, had, uh, cousins. Yeah. It was amazing that team. Louis Cruz, yeah. Wow, and uh, I remember yeah. St. Anthony. We all came together because Matty, you know, Matty was tough. You know, Matty was tough, but he took me under his wing, and you know, he left when I uh, I tried out. I was the only freshman ever tried for varsity basketball. He laughed at me, and then by the end of the year, I was starting varsity as a freshman. He uh, he took me under his wing. How, you know how to do this? This is what these scouts are looking for, and the way you look, the way you dress, the way you talk. Don't do this. And then when I got to college, RAF was even on a higher level. The NBA is looking for this. You know, a future employer is going to like, you know, is going to look at you the way you dress, the way you talk. It was a good learning experience for me because I was fortunate because these 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 kind of mentors were right there for me. Um, so and I, like I said, I still talk to RAF every day, which you know, he's like a father to me. So, Danny, you're a fucking savage, bro. <laughs> And I want to well, thank listen, you. I got to run. I, I know, no. Run, I want to so, thank uh, you for what your family did for me, and uh, just let me know I could do it. That's that's the gift your family welcome, gave bro. to me, You're bro. The best. I love you, I'm man. I'm proud of you. You, you came. I love you too. Thank you for calling. And, uh, we'll be in touch, brother. I'll be in I Jersey like next man. week in Newark if you want to come to the show. I'll be there with Rogan yeah. on a Friday night. I got some other people coming from Rumford, so I'll give you a call. All right, that's All great. Right. Go. Thank you, brother. My 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 All condolences. Right, love you. Thank you. Bye. I got a question for you, because uh, when, we when we went to do the documentary, we talked to Barone, who was your basketball coach, and uh, for me, I've always been a chubby Jew, so I, I was never good at sports, but one thing my parents, my mom and my, my dad did, I always was in sports. What did, did it, well, Do you think sports was important in your life? Because I was never good at it, but I feel like it taught me... Like how to be like uh, how to keep working and stuff. And you talked about you quit in high school, but you uh, you uh, applied that to comedy. Like, do you think sports was important to you? Yes. At that, what I did, what I did, people was the biggest fucking mistake of my life. One of the first things my mother did with me when I was six was she threw me into karate. Mm -hmm. And I went to karate diligently. Yeah, me too. Diligently, I went. You know, it was three, four times a week. I loved it. I loved getting beat up. I loved getting kicked. I loved the jogging. I loved everything. The exercise. We moved to Jersey. I went and signed up at Gushinru Karate and Fujian Pai Kung Fu. So I was going to two things at once. Plus, at night, we'd go to a fucking basement and beat the fuck out of each other <laughs> in Union City. 
I stayed in that. Somewhere along the line, like I said, I got left back and I was so insecure about the left back that I focused on school grades and basketball and karate. That was it. Nothing was going to break me. Pussy, nothing. Somewhere along there, I started smoking pot with the guys in the corner. Just as athletic type guys. We were jocks, but we got high. A little okay. bit of reef, a little bit of Led Zeppelin, never killed nobody. <laughs> it wasn't like we did drugs. Everything I devoted my life for that summer of 77, those two summers, was basketball. I played basketball probably 12 hours a day. I figured out the fucking math. And then I ended the day with 300 fucking jump shots at night, listening to the song Remains the Same. Paul Keltos, who will be at the Miami shows this weekend, would do that for me. This is no shit. When I got to freshman year and the guy shut me down, I let him shut me down. Instead of me fucking being strong, going, this guy can suck my dick, I'm going to get better in my sophomore year, start JV, or at least make JV, I gave up. I started doing drugs. I started doing THC crystal, blah, blah, blah. I got the lung infection. In fact, somebody on Twitter sent me an article the other day that the government salt sprayed paraquat on marijuana in the 80s. That was what fucked up my lung. Once that happened, I just gave up. Once my mother died in November of 79, I just gave up on basketball completely. I would play basketball to make money at Hashways, like for a dollar a game. Oh, okay. We'd play one-on-one or something, so you got $3, and I'd make 10 bucks and get a roast beef sandwich and a soda. That's how I played basketball. I was still very good. I could jump. I just knew that I wasn't going to be cool. But I made a judgment call on my own life. You never do that. You never say to yourself what you can do. And that's why I always tell people, I know you don't want to work under commission, but think if you sell cars or if you sell fucking paneling or if you sell roofing, and you're going to work under com- uh, commission. And there's days you're going to make $10,000. You didn't give yourself a fucking ceiling over your, right. on your, your life. That was the first time I ever cut my own legs off. What am I going to go to school for? I'm a loser anyway. I should have never done that. So from that experience, from quitting Kung, Kung Fu... Because all I did was when Gushin Ru Karate was my 15th birthday, I said, I'm going to go to a tournament, and I'm going to win this tournament. Right after I come home, I'm going to take first place for fighting and first place for forms. I'm never going to go back to karate. I got disqualified for fighting because it was semi-contact. I hit him in the head. Okay. And I went home and took first place in the karate forms. And right there, I never went back to karate. Big fucking mistake. I was a purple belt. Because you won, you didn't go back? Yeah, I, no, because I was into pussy, and I wanted to smoke dope. It, I didn't have time for everything. I didn't have time to play basketball, then come home, eat, take another bus to Union City, and do karate. It was just too fucking much for me. Yeah. So I had to give up one of them. So I gave up karate to party. Then I gave up basketball. Those two lessons, guess what? When I was 415 pounds... I went to a karate school. I didn't go to the karate school to lose weight as much as get my discipline in my life back. I wanted my life to be simple how I was when I was 15. Yeah. So I went back to Kung Fu. Until today, I still do a martial art three times a week. Now it's kickboxing. But I still go to something just so it could take me back to where I was when I was 15, when I was doing good things in my life. The basketball taught me to not quit. When I got into comedy, it took me a year to really focus on comedy. Because I wanted to make sure I was going to dive into it with both hands. Yeah. I didn't want what happened with basketball to happen with the comedy. So I was going to give up right away. So I got a job as a doorman, which was good and bad because it let me ask comedians questions about their lives. Were they married? What does your wife say of you leaving for a week? How is it? How is the road? You know, when you first get into comedy, people talk to you about the road. You think it's this fucking mystical thing that you're on the road and you're hanging out with Bob Seger and Bon Jovi. <laughs> it's all the same. Only then, no, it's just you, you learn, you know. So all the things that I did with basketball, how I failed with basketball, I applied to comedy so that would never, ever happen again. So if I hit a bump in the fucking road, I wouldn't just run away like a little girl and cry. I would stick with it. Mm-hmm. And that's what basketball taught me, to stick with it. What, How I fucked up with basketball was what made me stronger with comedy because I didn't give up because something bad happened. Because some guy said no or or some guy didn't want me in his club or some agent didn't want to sign me. Most people would crumble under that because I crumbled as a a young adult. I knew I'd never fucking crumble again. And that's that's the question. Yeah, and and, I mean... It's uh, I think it's important. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know what it, it's. A little, I don't know if it's a little different for girls, but I know for me, any kid I have isn't going to be athletic, or I'd be very surprised if they were. But I, and, I, and I never started. 
You, you, you talked about starting JV. I never started a, a game a day in my life, but I played. I did something. I did Taekwondo or wrestling or, or baseball or soccer. It. I did it until I went to high school and they had the, the audiovisual stuff. And I even I wrestled until my junior year of high school. But uh, I, think it's, I think it's important. Um, and I don't know what you're planning on doing with your daughter. It's very far in the future. But I think it's... Uh, it, and it doesn't have to be sports, but I think something that make, that you have to go every day and, and, and practice, I think it's important for people to do. So, I mean, hearing him talk about it, and he got to the pros, I mean, it's... Uh, Six foot one, not the fastest guy in the world, but he was a scoring machine. He wasted no movement, everything he did. He knew the game. He knew when to apply energy. He knew when to apply pressure. You know, you can't run for 50 fucking minutes so you know how to sit back. He knew. I mean, he led the fucking county in scoring. He led the nation in scoring in Division One basketball his senior year. From Seton Hall? Wow. Ooh. Oh, shit. Yeah, from Seton Hall. From the Pirates of Seton Hall. And he went there with a kid, Matty Pickenich, who had gone to Cincinnati and then transferred to Seton Hall, who was another pure shooter. And he died about 10 years ago of a heart attack. And this kid... You know, it was very hard. I remember I found out about Matty dying on a ski lift. I was skiing. And uh, I was in Colorado skiing. And somebody on the lift said, you know, Matty picking this guy. And he just knew him. How, what a fucking coincidence. He just knew him. Yeah. But, you know, when you play football in my hometown, they always talk about how Bruins, you got to be this. And they're hard-nosed. And they won the States. And they're very good at football. But what... uh I learned from North Bergen was watching this guy play basketball. He was fucking relentless. And on the streets, when he played on the courts on the streets, he was fucking relentless. How many years older is he than you, do you think? He was a senior when I was a, a freshman. Oh, those guys. I don't know what it is about those guys, but especially when you're a freshman and the seniors, there's a bunch of guys that, like, it's very, you're, they're, you're very, uh, what's the word? Um... They're very important and they, they, uh, they're in, they're influential well, the in your life. Them, yeah. The rest of them were jerk offs. He, was when I was a freshman, our freshman class was so fucking strong. Our freshman class was so fucking strong that the seniors paid attention to us. Really? Yeah. We were fucking crazy. We didn't fuck around. That was a crazy freshman fucking class. Remember, we used to have a thing called Field Day where every year the kids, they set up amusement park. That stopped when we became freshmen. One of our class got caught fucking a Hindu chick in the bathroom. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, we, we, we were robbing beer trucks. We were doing a lot of shit that those guys, in fact, one of the greatest stories ever was that at my house before my mother died, my mother went to Florida. She owned the property where my Emmy International was, and she went to sell it. This is maybe three weeks before she died. And I had a party in my house. And this Dominican kid, who was my brother at the time, who's still around from time to time I hear he says hello. They call him Louis the nigger. He was Dominican kid. He was Dominican, but he was black with an afro, so they called him Louis the nigger. But he was a great kid. <laughs> he didn't give a fuck. Uh, he was from Houston Street in the city. What was I talking about? I don't even fucking know what I'm about the party in my house. So I had a party in my house. Freshman football, they had two senior girls that were doing the stats. Okay. These freshmen were fucking these girls. And they were both had boyfriends that were like gorillas of the varsity football team. This is real. This is how fucking crazy the freshmen were. So my friend Louie was banging Darcy Head, who was this blonde chick that, that did the stats that was fucking amazing. Just amazing, this blonde girl. She, I made out with her my freshman year and sophomore year. She was a dirty fucking animal. But this girl was a savage. I mean, she was one of the first girls that went for my dick, and I almost had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> like, I had never had a girl go for my dick. I almost had a nervous breakdown. Like, I, didn't, I just came and left. I didn't even <laughs> take her pants off, nothing. So one of my friends was banging her, and her boyfriend came over. Okay, this is a true story. And I'm in my living room, my st my father had a seven, a six foot statue of Lazarus, Saint Lazarus. He's the dog with the two crutches. He's the saint yeah. with the two crutches. The dog's licking his wounds. He has uh, leprosy or whatever, and the dogs are licking his wound. And the crutches were removable. Okay. Okay, and we're in the kitchen hanging out, and all of a sudden, Brand and all these fucking gorillas come up. And this Eddie Borelli kid's like, hey, man, where's Darcy? We're like, we don't fucking know. He's like, I'm going upstairs. And this kid, Chris, the Red Devil, okay. was from Cliffside Park, took one of the fucking crutches. And he goes, anybody crosses this line, I'm busting your fucking head with the crutch. We were all freshmen, dog. This guy just called out a senior. He goes, you fucking walk through here, we'll bust your fucking skull with this fucking uh, uh, this, uh, crutch. crutch. And these motherfuckers were like, you know what? You just signed your death certificate. 
you guys are going to have a problem. But they left. And I remember Morelli would fuck with me after that, but he couldn't fuck with me. They couldn't fuck with me because the freshmen were so fucking crazy. You know, this is when I started going to concerts. You know, my freshman year, I hooked up with Conti and Rago and all these motherfuckers together. It was all over. So that's when I became a fucking lunatic, when I became a freshman. I mean, remember I tell you the story? We had the gourmet club oh. <laughs> and went into the city, and we picked up booze. That was freshman year. That was all freshman year. The teachers had to fucking leave and shit. He also had a sister, Danny, that was an art teacher that was very sweet. You know, he had 13 fucking kids. Both his parents were deaf. This kid had to be an All-American. He had to go fucking pro. So it was a pleasure having him on the show today, just to let you motherfuckers know how we run. Where's that, where's that Zeppelin song you have for me? Yeah, we got, got two of them. We got uh, Which one do you want to play? Play the first one first. We got to break this shit up. Hold on one second. Yesterday, in the middle of everything, because before you saw me, I was even fucking hot. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, before you saw me, I was hot. In the middle of everything, I went over to the fucking Y. My wife went, I went first. And I went to the Y, did 30 on the epileptical, and I hit the bag for 25 fucking minutes. First thing I did when I got home was I took two of those fucking strong bones with a big glass of water after acupuncture, okay? The night before that, I went to 8 o'clock fucking kickboxing. And the day before that, I fucking walked around that North Hollywood Park five times, and I did the Dolce run where you uh, walk for two minutes and run for 30 seconds. Said to me, Joey, are you sore today? Ask me. Are you sore today, Joey? Fuck no! <laughs> You know why? Because I took like four strong bones yesterday to the day before. I'm at the end of this. Uh, I'm at the end of this strong bone cycle, so I gotta get on it to send me some more. Don't fuck up. You're a fat fuck. You get joint pain. Your knees hurt. Your elbows. Your shoulders. Do me a favor. Go to on it. Get the starter package. Get the fucking new mood, which I took two of last night. I slept like a babe. Dog, I didn't make it 15 minutes after you saw me. And really? I drank a <laughs> cup of coffee. Yeah. I drank a cup of coffee too. Jesus. I went home, wrote two jokes or something that I had on my mind, and I put that air conditioning on, I pissed, I kissed the wife, and I fucking left. I went to sleep. <laughs> That's I could sleep on fucking... Where's the music, Lee, cocksucker? You said the it's a beautiful day to be alive. Get up there. Get out. Get out of the fucking house. Hit it, Lee. I, gotta die. I had to let that go for a second. Sorry. Um, yeah, so we have that. You have Austin. Miami, uh, Austin, yeah. May 2nd to the 5th, I think, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. San Antonio Dead Squad's coming up, representing. Let me give some shout-outs. My main man, Mark Wren, fucking Doug Paquette, James Malia, I love you, cocksucker. Jill Himitsu, giving donations on a web page. I don't know what it is off the top of my fucking head. But contact uh, Ed Wilson. I love you. Neil Samuels, you're still the funniest fucking Jew online. I, I I love this guy. If you're not following Neil Samuels, you're fucking shooting yourself in the head. Fuck Joe Diaz and Rogan <laughs> and Ari and all these comedians. If you're not fighting, if you're not following this fucking Jew, Neil Samuels, there's something wrong with you. This guy is as real as Uncle Joey. He said something yesterday about a twat something. That I was rolling. This guy does heroin. He does. They don't give a fuck. This is the Jews I fucking grew up with. I know one of his uncles stabbed fucking Jesus in the leg. <laughs> I know it. I know it for a fact that one of his uncles was right there. And he said, "Give me a fucking knife. I'm gonna stab this fucking long head buck in the thigh." That's how much I love Neil Samuels. He's the last of the real fucking Jews. Not like some people I know that cry in the car when I offer him I an edible. Cry. You know what Neil Samuels would do if I gave him that fucking edible? Yeah, he'd he would do eat the fucking whole thing without even think, without even looking at me. He'd say, I'm a fucking Jew. Yeah, and um, then two years later, he'd be like, fuck you, Joey. No, he would not. Yo, fucking, I, how many... This motherfucker, Lee Samuels, would take that edible, rub it on his fucking head, and put the yarmulke over it. <laughs> and let that motherfucker ferment under that. Jesus Christ. Get your shit together, Lee. You're slipping as a Jew. That's it. <laughs> this is the last week. Your mom was in town. I'm forgive you. Monday, we're back on the fucking Edible 601. Yeah, fuck you, you got nowhere to go Monday night. I want to hear no story. I'm going to get deep into your fucking cock sucker. You're at, you're at Cap City, second to the fourth. Second to the fourth. Thank you're you very much. I want to give a shout out all the Dead Squad fucking chapters that are popping up. You, We got Sons of Anarchy beat. Fuck those motherfuckers. We're going to get tricycles and ride up and down the fucking country. You know uh, I was just going to say, you guys should start doing uh, the uh, Harley, like the Hells Angels have little jackets. I got stuff. one. They're coming already. Who the fuck you think you're <laughs> dealing with here? The church with a fucking skull with a fucking cigar in his mouth. You follow me? Who the fuck you think you're dealing with? I love with? it. Lee, what are you going to do this weekend? You're going to Vegas? You're going to make some Until money? Saturday, yeah. And then uh, for everyone who is, hasn't listened, starting May 1st, I'm going to do a juice. 
Uh, if you want to join me, I'm going to do a YouTube video with my recipe. If you don't want to juice but you want to be healthy and do on it stuff, we're starting May 1st, so get uh, get everything you need for that. And what is your goal? What is your goal in the weight loss? What is the end result? I'd like to lose another 100 pounds, but another for the for, for May, I uh, I want to lose 50. You're going to shave your beard. Fuck that. I look, I, look, you know, I look like a two-year-old if I don't have a beard. That's even perfect. Once you lose the weight, you shave it. You miss your little roommate. Don't you? I told you. Yeah, she's, she's he a good was friend. falling in love with her. I wasn't end. falling in love. Yes, fuck you, were. you. That little ass and that titty. But you didn't lock her in before. I told you to lock her in. She's you, two minutes on the road. She's not two minutes. She's in fucking Northridge somewhere. <laughs> You're not gonna go now. She's got her brother and the other guy fucking maneuvering the pussy, watching her asshole. She got fucking the black <laughs> boyfriend coming in, and he, you can't follow that. He's gonna fucking pork her with that fucking black cock. How are you gonna follow that? You're a fucking little <laughs> G. You gotta go in there, eat the ass, and punch her and choke her out. You're not gonna want to do that. I can't <laughs> choke her out. Yeah, I'll I'll have I'll have, call you when I need ten thousand dollars bail. What fucking, fucking bail? What bail? Yeah, you were saying that last night. You gotta just walk in. No girl's ever called in a guy the cops for sticking your dick in the mouth. Yes, they have. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they have. You're like, if you do it ten times, five girls will be pissed. But say, five girls will be pissed. I didn't say it like yes, that. You, you fucking you little... said. I said, listen. Let's say she's <laughs> sleeping on your fucking couch. She likes you. You like her. If you wake her up, if you rub that helmet on her cheek, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> you didn't say cheek, you said put it in her mouth. And well, then I said, her mouth, cheek, whatever. What's the difference at this point in the game? You got it over here, you're knocking on the door, you might as well just put it in like a sleep apnea fucking pill or something. Oh, Jesus Christ. Wait, you gonna smoke this? You're gonna let me I've, smoked I've already all smoked yeah, four smoked. fucking joints, I ate edible. What the fuck am I gonna do with you? I don't know, your eyes are already all the way closed. <laughs> are they already? I gotta go to the doctor. My blood pressure gonna be 190 <laughs> over 2000. I had a protein shake this morning, that's why those two little farts came out. <sighs> got a little protein, a little banana in there, a little uh, peanut butter. Bam! <laughs> Bam, Lee, 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 I love you, cocksucker. You're a good fucking dude. Thanks, Start next. We got some shirts we want to show for my man to for you, but we're not going to do them today. We're going to get another camera set up. It's taking Lee about four months to do this. Four one. months. It'll and be ready Monday. And, and he won't claim back. responsibility. I don't know. You told me two told, weeks ago. I, yeah, Meanwhile, he's in Vegas. He's well watching with his mother. <laughs> fucking well watching. I need this shit. One weekend a year, Malone comes to visit. You make him come in. And Dickie came a month ago, and you yeah, got to drive him. You're a fucking nightmare. Get yeah, it together. Twice. You're Tell these motherfuckers no more coming out here. And they fly out on Tuesdays from now on. <laughs> what else? So we got Miami this week at 420. Yeah. On fucking Saturday, we got great fights. Gilbert Melendez on the card. We got a great, that's a great fucking fight. So all I'm telling you is do me a favor. You got three days left in the fucking week. End the week off strong. Maybe you had a bad fucking Monday. Maybe you had a bad Tuesday. Who gives a fuck? You're the fucking man. Put it together. So what? You got no money. So what? Your wife left you. You got you. You got your cock and you got you. Hit it with a hammer. Do, do whatever you need to make yourself. Hit your cock with a hammer? You never did that? Fuck you, no. Why when, you when did you grow up? You never fucking take your dick and hit it with a little carpenter hammer? <laughs> what are you talking about? Lee. You How got, high are you? I'm, you not, I'm not high at all. This is bubbles gum shit. I'm, I'm, I'm calling bullshit on that one. And if anyone on Twitter says, oh yeah, hit my dick with a hammer, you're fucking lying. No one ever hits their dick with a hammer That's on how you become a man. No, See, it's you not. you became 13, they did a bar mitzvah. They cut your dick, right? No, they do that. They cut your dick when you're fucking born. Now, what do they do when you're 13? They don't rub it enough and put salt on it? No. They don't put kosher <laughs> salt in your little cool old nothing? You just get envelopes of money? Yeah. How much money did you get? Uh, a few grand, I think. What'd you do? You still got it, don't you? No, no, it's gone. At college. Did that check clear your mother gave you? Fuck you. No, no check, you fucking, fucking shit. Fucking people. Fucking guy comes You want 10% mother. of everything I make? Five! If your mother gives you a little taste, you gotta give me something. <laughs> something. 50, a bag of weed, something. You're getting hats from Tafoy. You're living like a doctor. I'm getting hats. We'll see what happens. I love you guys. I love you guys with all my heart. Thank you for following and for the support. Go to joeydiaz.net if you need a fucking hoodie, a long sleeve shirt, some t-shirts. Go over there. Talk to fucking JR. He's a good man. He's going to be in Arizona with me hanging out. Big black motherfucker. I love you. <laughs> JR's a good fucking dude. We talked yesterday. I miss him. He's, he's going to come up to LA. He's making moves, JR. So if you want to talk about t-shirt designs for your company or whatever, go to JR Design. Again, go to Onnit. Look at the fucking, excuse me, look at the webpage. Anything you fucking want in there. I can't get you a deal on the kettlebells or the jump rope or the fucking turbo walls. But any vitamins, you press in fucking, just do me a favor. C-H-U-R-C-H. In the box, 
Trust me, you're going to fucking love it. They keep you on emails. They send you hats. They do a bunch of shit for you. Number three, go to joeycocodias.net for all your tour. If you live in the area, I'm going to Salt Lake City this year. I'm coming back to San Jose. I'm going to Philly. No fuck, I'm going to Portland. I'm going to Buffalo before the years. I'm going to Lexington, Kentucky, bitches. So break out the fucking cowboy hats and the, and the bluegrass reefer. <laughs> you know, we ain't fucking around this year is what I'm trying to tell you. Lee Syatt's coming to San Jose and a couple other dates. I will be in New Jersey next week with fucking Rogan. And that's it, you bad motherfuckers. I can't wait to see you savages in Miami. I will be bringing a camera to take the testicle testament. I got Carlos Perez. I got a bunch of fucking people coming down. I miss you, Lee. The ticket was just too much, though. That fucking that's fine. ticket to fucking New York, I ended up paying 700 Jesus. But, oh, you should... Uh, uh, we won't do it today, but we, you, next time we'll, we'll have you break down airline prices for me. Like you on the way to the to the club last night, you're like, all right, you got to on Tuesdays, you got to go and get the half price miles. I've been doing this for twenty <laughs> fucking years, people. You know, I've been flying, so you fucking learn little tricks of the trade, and I'm here to help you. You got any questions about flying or whatever? You got to buy it a month in advance. You got to join all the programs; they're free. Join the programs, get the miles, and learn to negotiate. Get a sleep apnea machine, get yourself a dog, walk around with one eye. <laughs> I, the, the goal is to get a good fucking scene on a plane. And that's what the fuck I do. The other thing, people have been complaining. Joey, the tickets in Miami are too high. I'm not Live Nation, people. Let me break something down for you just so you people enjoy something. If it was up to me, if you gave me 5 to $10 to come watch me, I'd fucking take it. But I can't do that. The clubs don't allow that. So me, I like to charge you guys $17. I know things are fucking rough. 17 is fair. You're like, Joey, where did you come up with 17 After the government, after Lee takes my money, after my <laughs> wife, and after the agent, I got $10 left. So $7 goes away. I keep fucking 10 We make each other laugh. We smoke a joint. You go home happy. I go home happy. Everybody goes home happy. I don't like when they charge people $35 either. I don't fucking like it. I don't like when they charge over $20 for me. I'm not worth more than $25 fucking, $20. Fucking dollars. I ain't a lot of you. We have a good time. We hear some fucking stories. So don't yell at me. These people set a price. They ask me what I want. I want 17. You know, when I went to ticket price for this shit, it was 20 and 9 to Ticketmaster. What do you want me to do? You want me to become fucking uh, Pearl Jam and go to war with these people? All I want to do is do a couple jokes for you people and keep it fucking simple. I love you guys. I'm not here to rob nobody. I don't want to be fucking rich and have a convertible BMW. I just want to cover Lee. This motherfucker eats and wants to gamble now and you know yeah, everybody yeah. wants to have a good time Nobody, and mom gives him a check you think I see ten dollars anything drip down to fucking Uncle Joey who got I get nothing <laughs> he no keeps check. the whole fucking envelope this cocksucker <laughs> anyway I love you guys from the bottom of my heart I love Lisa yeah, he's a good guy uh, Jill Himitsu, all you motherfuckers that contribute on Twitter and Facebook what the fuck can I say about you we got something special man let's keep it alive have a great week on it Fucking Dan Calandrillo. Everybody today. Hit that shit, Lee.